Good evening. I pray everybody's doing well tonight. It's good to see you guys here tonight. Before we get started, if you would please stand with me and we'll open up in prayer and then you guys can have a seat. Just relax. Just, just worship the Lord, right? Sing from your heart. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, so much for this evening that you've given us. And Lord God, help us now to focus on you, Lord, to focus on our time of worship with you, to focus on your word, Lord. And and God, we know, Lord, that there's just so much around us, God, to distract and, Lord, to cause us to fear, cause us to take our eyes off of you, Lord. Cause us not to trust, Lord. And Father, the enemy would love more than anything, God, to be successful in using those things. So, Father, help us to remember, Lord, what you did. Help us to remember who you are, Lord. So many times you've taken us out of the valley, Lord. And, God, you've given us hope, Lord. So, Father, we love you. We thank you. We pray that you would watch over us tonight, Lord. We pray for our church family, God, that's enduring suffering right now, Lord. There's many who are suffering, many who are hurting and lonely. But, God, it's so good to just remember, Lord, what you did 2,000 years ago, Lord. You gave us hope, Lord. We have hope this night, Lord. We love you. We thank you, God. Just bless our time tonight, Lord, as we remember you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys may be seated. skies of Beth, the ham appeared a star, the well angels sang the lowly shepherds, three wise men seeking truth, they traveled from afar, hoping to find the child from heaven. And falling on their knees, they bow before the humble Prince of Peace. And I'll bring an offering of worship to my King. No one on earth deserves the praises that I sing. Jesus, may you receive the honor that you're due. And, oh, Lord, I bring an offering to you. The sun could not compare to the glory of your love. There is no shadow in your presence. No mortal man would dare to stand before your throne, before the Holy One of Heaven. It's only by your blood, and it's only through your mercy lord i come and i'll bring an offering of worship to my king no one on earth deserves the praises that i sing jesus may you receive the honor that you're due oh lord i bring an offering to you now bring an offering of worship to my king no one on earth deserves the praises that i sing and jesus may you receive the honor that you're due and oh lord i bring an offering to you oh lord i bring an offering to you oh lord i bring 
an offering to you. Amen. Cause you are God in heaven. And here am I on earth. So I'll let my words be few. Jesus, I am so in love with you. Could you stand with us? And I'll stand in awe of you. Yes, I'll stand in awe of you. And I'll let my words be few. Jesus, I am so in love with you. The simplest of all love songs I want to bring to you so I'll let my words be few Jesus I am so in love with you And I stand in awe of you. Yes, I stand in awe of you. And I'll let my words be few. Jesus, I am so in love with you. Let's do that one more time. I'll stand. And I stand in awe of you. Yes, I stand in awe of you. And I'll let my words be few. And I'll let, and I'll let my words be few. And I'll let my words be be few. Jesus, I am so in love with you. Father, we come before you this evening to thank you, Lord, for your love and your goodness towards us, God, your grace and your mercy. And Father, we pray that this evening that you would be with us, watch over us, God. That you'd take care of us, God. Lord, that you bind the enemy from this place. That you would keep away any distractions, interruptions, Lord. Father, that it would be you that we seek, that you de we desire to please and to hear from tonight. 
And Father, we pray again that we would just open our hearts to you, Lord. <clears throat> we pray for those who are sick. We pray for those who are lonely. Father, we pray for those who have lost loved ones, God. We pray for, Father, your protection from the pandemic, Lord, from illness and suffering, God. We pray that you would be glorified in this place and by your people, Lord. We look to you this evening. May your spirit have full control. May he lead us and guide us into all truth, God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good evening. How is everybody tonight? All right. Glad to see you guys. Go ahead and have a seat. And uh, we'll get uh, ready this evening. It's always great to be with you and those that are outside right now. Um, watching on the screen, big screen, and those that might be watching as we stream our, our study to you. Uh, we do want to uh, lift up a few prayer requests, and then we'll look into our study this evening. I want to pray for, uh, continue to pray for the, uh, the Ramos family, uh, again, uh, for God's comfort and peace, for my sister-in-law, um, for her husband who, who passed last week. We do pray for her and her comfort, and um, Pray for Araceli, as she's, uh, I, I don't know where she's at at the moment. She went to Mexico, again, to be with her family, because her father, you know, uh, succumbed to the, uh, uh, to the pandemic. And uh, the, Galindo, uh, the Galindo family, for uh, Brother Ruben, uh, he too, um, he was, uh, you know, uh, succumbed to this disease. So we do want to pray for those families and uh, for God's comfort and God's peace. I want to pray for the children's Christmas uh, program. Uh, coming up this Saturday. Uh, so we do want to lift them up and all those involved, and we do pray that the families uh, come and enjoy that time. They would be blessed, and uh, the kids would be blessed, and it would just be a, a, a joyful time. And we do want to pray for <clears throat> the election. You know, in spite of what we see and what we hear, it's not over. It's not over. Congress has not declared a president. A lot of things have not been, though, president-elect is moving along like, you know, it's a done deal. It's not. And we need to pray that God's will would be done. And, uh, you know, we need to let people know God is not finished yet. And uh, only God can do what God can do. So we do want to continue to pray for the election and that God's will would be done. So let's pray. Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. And as your word says, we are to come in Jesus' name. And we're to ask according to your will, <clears throat> and it will be done. And Father, we do have some prayer requests here, Lord, and especially for our families and loved ones. God, we pray for the Ramos family, that God, you would comfort them and give them that peace that only comes from you, God, that can only had by you, Lord. Father, <clears throat> for my own family, Lord, for my sister-in-law, Father, just, um, again, as many that just, it, it's just hard to believe that we're here one minute and gone the next. And yet James tells us we are but a vaporous smoke, God. And uh, Lord, be with her and comfort her during this time and, and just give her that peace. And the Galindo family, the same prayer, Lord, Araceli's family, Lord, all of them, God, may you comfort them and, and protect them from the virus, Lord. We, protect, we pray for the children's Christmas program, Lord, that you would bless the kids, bless them beyond measure, and the parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, all that will come to see, Lord. Bless that night, again, to your glory, Father, again, that we would be reminded of, of Christmas and, and the, what your purpose and intent is, Lord, uh, was at the beginning and to this day, Lord. And we do pray for the election, God. Lord, we know that so much has been said and done, and God, only you know the truth, God. But Lord, may your perfect will be done, Lord. May you intervene in all of this, God. May you, um, again, reveal your will, God, in, in, in this election, God. And uh, it ain't over till you say it is, Lord. Regardless of what man does and what man says and what man sees, Lord, you're on the throne. No government, no party, no individual, Lord. You are on the throne. Be blessed. Be glorified, God. 
And so, Lord, we pray that you would cover us tonight, you would bless us in this time, and Lord, that you would um, speak to us through Job tonight, God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, open your Bibles to Job 29. Job 29. <clears throat> this evening, the message is about Job's past. Job recalls the blessings in the past. The last half of Job's response to Bildad's <clears throat> third and last speech <clears throat> that starts here in chapter 29 and goes on through verse 31. The first half began in chapter 26 and 27 and 28. But chapter 29 and 39, uh, 31 tonight begins, is a, it's a long rebuttal uh, by Job. And it's his main defense for the accusations that were made against him by his so-called three friends. So Job continues to defend himself as he's done on along, all along in all of his speeches, trying here to defend himself against the accusations made against him by his friends. And the accusations made against Job had to do mostly with Job's past. So Job talks about several different phases of his past. And here in chapter 29, Job remembers the blessings of his past. Let's begin with verses 1 and 2 of chapter 29. And Job says, he, it says, Job further continued his discourse and said, Oh, that I were as in months past, as in the days when God watched over me. God, Job said, man, I wished it was, I was back in the days, man, when everything was going well and when God was watching over me. So the inference is, the days he's living aren't that great, and then God isn't watching over him. Job here is longing for the past. And how many people and, and, and Christians look at the past and they say, man, I wish I could go back. Then they look at the present time that they're in with sorrow, and they look to the future with anxiety. Because they don't know what lies ahead for them. None of us do. Here's Job's complaint. First, the man, there's the man who's lost the hopefulness of his present time, this time that he's living in, because Job doesn't see any signs of anything good ahead in his future. And another part of this big complaint by Job, which it also very often is, a, is, is imagined, is the one that <clears throat> we're crying about. Not so much because of signs. You know, we, we don't cry out many times because of, of signs as much as because we don't enjoy a long-lasting <clears throat> peace of mind about other things. One person says, oh, I wish it was like it used to be in the months past. Because, you know, whatever tr troubles I had then, they weren't that big a deal. Another person might say about his enjoyment in the house of God and God's grace, oh, in months past when I went to the house of God, oh, how sweet it was then to hear God's word. Then? What about now? God's word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Then there are some people who really get discouraged because their conscience <clears throat> isn't as sensitive as it used to be. Their heart, cry, their heart cries out in bitterness. Oh, I wish I, I, I was like I used to be many months ago when I first knew the Lord. Man, I was almost afraid to do anything wrong because I didn't want to go astray. I didn't want to hurt God. I didn't want to disappoint Him. Then there are some who just don't have as much excitement as they used to for the wonder of God. And seeing people saved they just don't have that excitement about the wonder of God and seeing people saved anymore that they once used to have. But now we're going to look at what causes that and the cure for these different people with these different emotions and feelings about the past, the present, and the future. One of the causes of this unhappy condition of things is a defective prayer life. 
You see, the cure to, to unhappy conditions is right next to the cause of that unhappy condition. Many times we spend so much time complaining and very little time praying about that unhappy condition. You, could be, you may not be as happy as you used to be because you don't pray like you used to pray. And nothing brings such emptiness to a man's soul as the lack of prayer. Maybe you tonight are saying, oh, I wish it was like it used to be. And a lot of times the peop people think it's the pastor's fault. It's the church. I'm not getting fed here anymore. But if the word is being taught, many times it's not the teacher, it's the listener. Because they're not feeding themselves. You know, I can put a buffet of the, most f of the finest cuisine before you. But if you don't eat of it, it's not going to do you any good. And I, I remember I went through that phase. When I got saved and a couple of years later as I started to grow in the Lord, it's like, <clears throat> you know, and I was going to Golden Springs. You know, I told Kathy, you know, I'm, I'm just not getting fed here anymore. I need more. I need, you know, I need, I don't know what I need. I just knew that I felt that I needed more. And, and we started searching. You know, we went to different churches for about a month and looking. At, and I didn't find that thing that I, I, I felt that I was missing and that I was looking for. And then as I was saying, Lord, you know, find me the right church. And, and, and one that teaches the word and one that just is going to, you know, give me that, that kick. And God says, well, what was wrong with the church you were at? And, and, I, and I began to examine the, in the, the Golden Springs and, you know, Pastor Rawl, and, and I said, Pastor Rawl teaches the Word of God. There was nothing wrong with his teaching. What was wrong was something with me. You know, I was expecting him to basically, like a, a lot of times, the, the pastor, the church, <clears throat> the staff or whatever, to do all of the work. <laughs> and I went back with the attitude, I'm going to go and, I, and I'm going to receive what I'm being taught. And it changed everything. And it, as many of you might know, I was there. I went on staff there. And as a result, here I am with this church. It was never Pastor Rawl. It was never what he wasn't teaching. It was me. I wasn't eating from the table that he had set before me, or God had set before me through Pastor Rawl. There's a better reason for, for, for one's low spiritual life. It's not so much, as I said, that the food is bad or the pastor who's serving it up as it is your lack, my lack of eating and what's being served. Jesus said in John 6, 56 and 57, For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink, in, drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me live because of me. Jesus wasn't speaking about cannibalism. What he's saying here is that the bread must be taken in. You must eat of me. It must be I must be taken in, and you abide in me, and I abide in you, and you will live. But many times the reason for this complaint is because of sin, idolatry. Many have given their hearts to something else and not to God. And they've given their love for the things of the earth instead of the things in heaven. Maybe we've become self-confident and self-righteous and self-sufficient. And if that's the case, that's a reason why it's not like it used to be. These regrets shouldn't be continual. They need to, they need to be removed. 
And how do you do that? You go back to where you started. And not knowing it then, but that's what God really said to me. Go back, Joe, to where you got you started. Pastor all led you to the Lord. He, you, you, you started going to his church. Go back to where you started. Jesus said to the loveless church in Revelation 2, 5, you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. Jesus didn't say that you, you lost, and I hadn't lost my love. See, I was going out looking, Lord, where can I find more? Jesus didn't say that the, the, the loveless church didn't lose their love. They left their first love. It speaks of a willful neglect. They didn't go off track when it came to the word of God. It was their personal relationship with Jesus that went off track. And Jesus, the cure was, remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent, which means return, do the first works. Go back, Joe, where you left off, where it all started. Joe's past was one of prosperity. He says three things about his prosperity. In verse 2, notice he says, God watched over me. Job realized he was protected and well taken care of in his flourishing prosperity. But the protection was removed when the calamities came because Satan complained that God had made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side. It wasn't because Job had done anything wrong that that protection was removed. But Satan challenged God back in chapter 1, verse 10. The only reason that, God, that, that Job serves you, God, is because you put a hedge around him. You put a hedge of protection around his household, and you put a hedge of protection on every side of him. God does protect us, and he does preserve us in our earthly lives. More importantly, God protects and preserves the redeemed for all eternity. Jesus said in John 10, 27 through 29, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, that is, those who hear his voice, and they follow me. Notice, there's the key. They follow me, and I give them, I give those who follow me eternal life. It's not a blanket statement to, to, to all who claim to profess Christ specifically to them who hear me. I know those who hear me. I know those who follow me. And I give those, those particular people eternal life. And they're the ones that shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. The word follow in those verses uh, means to cleave steadfastly to one, to cleave steadfastly to one, to conform wholly to his example in living and if in need dying also. Those are the ones Jesus gives eternal life. Who cleaves steadfastly to him, who conforms wholly to his example, completely his example, and they live, and if in need, they die for him. Those are the ones who shall never perish. A lot of people follow Jesus to church, but not to the cross. He said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, follow me. You know, and, and, and that's speaking to the cross. Pick up his cross, he said. Let them deny himself, pick up their cross, and then follow me. Between the desire to follow, there's a cross. You can't bypass the cross to follow Jesus. When Jesus called you and me to be saved, he called us to a life of dying. To a life of dying to myself, to my flesh, to every whim, to every desire that is not pleasing to God or in the will of God. Then in verse 6 and 19, it speaks about the greatness of Job's prosperity. Let's look at verse 6. We'll be, we won't be following them in order. We'll be covering all the verses, but we'll be, you know, uh, we won't be following them in, in order. Verse 6. When my steps were bathed with cream and the rock poured out rivers of oil for me. Verse 19. My root is spread out to the waters and the dew lies all night on my branch. 
my, these verses in the New Living Translation, verse 6 says, My cows produce milk in abundance, and my groves poured out streams of olive oil. Uh, in verse 19, For I am like a tree whose roots reach the water, whose branches are refreshed with the dew. Job gives four pictures here that represent his greatness when he was, he was flourishing in his prosperity. First, cream. Cream. Washing one's steps in butter emphasizes, or cream, which that was speaking of is butter. Washing one's steps in cream or butter emphasizes a very prosperous position in life. Second, he mentions oil. He said the rock poured out rivers of oil. This speaks of productive oil tree, olive trees, that are planted in stony ground for, for, for best production. Oil was one of the most valuable products of the country. And it was a big business in the city of Tyre. And the use of oil was a sign of gladness, and not having oil was a symbol of sorrow. Third, he uses the figure of a tree. The picture of a tree by waters always represents a picture of great prosperity. And the tree, as you've read through Scripture, it's a common picture, common image in Scripture, symbolizing both a kingdom and an individual. And like a tree, the godly person is alive. They're beautiful, they're fruitful, they're flourishing, they're useful, and they're enduring. The most important part of a tree is the roots that you can't see, that draws up the water and nourishes the tree. It's like the most important part of the Christian's life, their spiritual roots that lives on the hidden resources that we have in Christ. We have everything that we need in Christ. This is known as abiding in Christ. Fourth, Joe spoke about the dew. The picture of the dew on the leaves only adds to the greatness of the prosperity of Job. It was like rain. The dew is regarded as God's gift. The dew brought good crops. And the manna during Israel's escape from Egypt. So the dew became a symbol of fruitfulness and it was associated with God's word, the resurrection, and the remnant of God's people. Now going back to verse 3. Verse 3 th uh, speaks about the thankfulness of Job's prosperity. Look at verse 3. When his lamp shone upon my head, and when, my, and when by his light I walked through darkness. Job gives the credit for his prosperity to God. Deuteronomy 8.18, it says, And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. He gives you the ability to succeed and to get wealth and to be prosperous. He's the one who gives you the ability the words lamp and light in Scripture generally means life and prosperity. In spite of all of Job's problems, Job has been careful about the things that he says to give due credit to God for blessings. When we're going through troubles, we often fail to do that. We often fail to thank God for our past blessings. Paul said we're to thank God for everything. Usually we just complain. Verses 4 and 5. Job says, Just as I was in the days of my prime, when the friendly counsel of God was over my tent, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were around me. Job is thinking back now about five areas of the, of the privileged fellowship that he experienced in the past with God. He says there, man, when I was in my prime, he says, I felt God's friendship in my home. The Almighty God was still with me, and my, my children, they were all around me. Fellowship with God is the best kind of fellowship. Job is really wishing that he could have his fellowship with God again. Because he starts off with what he said about the past with a passionate request and a wish, oh, that things were like they used to be in the months past. He says that in verse 2. Oh, if it was only like it was in the months past. Unfortunately, not a, not a lot of people are that interested 
or that passionate about fellowship with God. Like the psalmist in Psalm 84, 1 and 2, one of my favorite psalms. The psalmist said, how lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. What was his flesh crying out for? The living God. Not the building, not the furniture, not the ceremonies. The living God. The psalmist here in Psalm 84, he didn't describe how beautiful the building was. He didn't say, oh, the tabernacle was gorgeous and I just, oh, I just longed to be there because it was such a beautiful building and all the latest equipment. Because you see, to the psalmist, it wasn't about the building. The psalmist was expressing his feelings because, his, because the tabernacle was so lovely when he thought about it. To his because, because that's where the living God, that's where he met the living God. His mind, his heart, his eyes, his whole being looked back to the tabernacle because he was looking for the presence of God. There was nothing on earth so beautiful to the eyes as the place where the saints gathered to worship with God. That's what makes this place so beautiful. We gather here together to worship God. You know, it, 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 if we didn't gather here to worship God, it would just be a social gathering. That's all it would be. That's all it would be. Charles Spurgeon said this, those are sorry saints who see nothing amiable in the services of the Lord's house. The tabernacle had been set up in several, several places. There were several rooms in it. All of it was lovely to the psalmist. Every curtain, every rope, every room. Even from far away, he got all excited and joyful just thinking about the holy place where Jehovah God would make himself known. It's as if he couldn't hold out anymore. I can't stand it anymore. Uh, he was just tired of waiting for that time when he could be in God's house with God. He was lovesick for God's house. And true servants of God love the courts of their king. Job says, as I was in the days of my prime. And this, th this time that, that Job is emphasizing here emphasizes the genuineness of this fellowship that he had with God. It took place when he was in a time of maturity, when he was prosperous, not when he was a little boy. A lot of people will reject God when prosperity comes, when good times come. They may not necessarily reject him per se, but you know what? It's like, I don't really need him. Hey, I, I, I've made it good. I got money or I'm, I'm you know, I, I'm doing well. I'm well off. Uh, you know, hey, er everything's really going good for me. You notice it's, it's when we just have a, a, like a crisis in our life, man, when, when that really draws us to him. But not Job. He says he loved it when the friendly counsel of God was over my tent. The tent was his home. The counsel of God or the revelation of God is what he says when he speaks of the counsel of God. Oh, he says when the friendly, you know, uh, counsel of God or the revelation of God, when God revealed himself to me, that was just so wonderful. Today we would say the word of God instead of friendly counsel. He's talking about that fellowship with God that he had. And fellowship with God results in the blessed result of learning from the divine word. You know, if one is out of fellowship with God, you won't spend much time in his word. And you won't learn much from his word if you're out of touch, out of fellowship with God. And you can't fellowship very well if you don't let the other person talk. You see, when you read the word of God, that, that's letting God talk to you. <clears throat> he said, 
when the friendly counsel of God was over my tent. Over my tent, as I said, it refers to Job's home. The fellowship with God was in Job's home where he lived. God was welcomed in Job's house. So sad that that's not that way today. He said, when my children were around me, in verse 5. Oh, the days I could look back to, man, when God was, you know, it was over my house. You know, he was, he was, he was in my house, and, and, and you know, I, I, I heard from him. I, I got his friendly counsel, man. He was revealing himself to me, and oh, when my children were all around me. You can almost hear him, his voice start to quiver. His voice begins to break down and tears welling up in his eyes when he said this, all oh, when my children were around me. Remember, in his past, Job was the, was the father of ten children, which meant God had richly blessed him because children are a great blessing, Psalm 127, verse 3 tells us. But all of Job's children were killed in the catastrophe that came upon him from Satan. Unlike the Bible in our day, millions of people don't value children as a valuable blessing. You hear on news more and more every day about the abuse of children, the, 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 the abuse, the beatings, and, and, and just horrific things. Murdering of children, not to mention just the, the abortions on command because children have become a burden or a hindrance to their goals and their dreams and their careers. Yeah, I don't have time to take care of one, but I have, a t I have, I have time to make one. <laughs> and one man said, parents mortgage the soul of their children just to buy things. Verses 7 and 8. Job says, oh, when I went out to the gate by the city, when I took my seat in the open square, the young men saw me and hid, and the aged arose and stood. And again, looking back to that time when he had a prominent position in the city. Job's position among men in the past, it was an important one. <clears throat> it was a highly respected one. And it's shown in two ways here by Job. And, it, it, you know, in different ways, Job shows that, that his position among men was very high. He sat at the gate of the city. At the gate of the city where, was where <clears throat> business was done. And to have a seat prepared for him in the, in the street there at the city gates, that Job says, that was, you know, that's, that he was one of the leading officials of the city. In verse 25, you see the word chief and king. This also shows his positions as being important among men. The word hid in verse 8, this doesn't mean that they were afraid of him or were afraid of the way he would act towards them. When he says they hid from me, it meant that they got out of my way in respect for his position. They would step back and they would just, you know, they'd let him pass. Also, having elders rise for you really speaks of the reputation of Job's position. Usually, it was the younger that stood in respect for the elder, but Job was so highly respected among men that even the elder stood up in respect for Job. Let's look at verse 9, 10, and then 21 through 23, beginning with verse 9. The princes refrained from talking and put their hand on their mouth. The voice of nobles was hushed, and their tongue stuck to the roof of their mouth. Verse 21. Men listened to me and waited and kept silence for my counsel, and after my words they did not speak again, and my speech settled on them as dew. They waited for me as for the rain, and they opened their mouth wide as for the spring rain. The subject here... It's talking about Job's counsel that, that when he spoke, what happened when people, when he, what people would do when he spoke. His counsel was so well spoken, he was so eloquent. He was so respected, others just 
shut up when he, when he spoke. You see, what Job had to say was thought of as more important than what they had to say. They waited for Job to speak compared to what, like he says, like people who wait for the rain. In order to, you know, to, to grow their crops. They waited for Job to speak like people who waited for the rain. Because Job's words were so helpful and so enlightening. This really rebukes Job's three friends because, you see, they gave very little respect to Job's words. But they were, they were fast, man, to pour out their own nonsense about him and make wrong accusations about him. Let's look at it, verse 11 and 12 and then verse 16. When the ear heard, then it blessed me. And when the eye saw, then it approved me. Because I delivered the poor who cried out, the father, fatherless and the one who had no helper. Verse 16, I was a father to the poor and I searched out the case that I did not know. <clears throat> In the place of judgment and power, Job was fair to those who were oppressed. He thoroughly examined their, their, their cases that they brought to him. He says, I gave the poor and the fatherless and the others who were less fortunate. He says, I gave them a hearing in court, that, that they, the, the hearing that they were entitled to. He was not a respecter of persons. He treated them equally. Everybody that had a case, he listened to. Everybody that was entitled to a hearing, he gave it to them. Job was so fair that when these people heard him speak, they blessed him. They blessed him. Man, we don't see this kind of fairness demonstrated very well by people in high positions today. Because many people in high positions often take advantage of those who are less fortunate. Verse 13 and then verse 15. The blessing of a perishing man came upon me, and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. Verse 15. I was eyes to the blind, and I was feet to the lame. Job wasn't just fair. He was also generous. He was liberal in his giving. He helped the less fortunate. It says, notice, he made the widow's heart sing for joy, which really shows how generous Job was. Earlier, Eliphaz accused Job of mistreating the widows and, mis and, and the unfortunate. Back in chapter 22, verse 9, this is what Eliphaz said to Job. He says, you have sent widows away empty, and the strength of the fatherless was crushed. <laughs> but Job says, no way. I was kind to the widows and the less fortunate. Verse 14. I put on righteousness, and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. This speaks about exceptional character. To be clothed in righteousness is to be covered with righteousness. Job's righteousness wasn't in just a few things here and there. Job's exceptional character, his, his righteousness, it, it was his whole life. This was his character, his whole life. And the word justice here speaks of fairness. It speaks about his work in court situations at the gate, at the city, uh, the, the gates of the city. Job says that his behavior as a judge was always with justice, that is fairness. Job doesn't say he was always right. But he does argue against the accusation that he was a great sinner, and, and that's what resulted in the problems that he was now experiencing. Verse 17. He said, I broke the fangs of the wicked and plucked the victim from his teeth. Job was an enemy of evil. Job dealt strongly with wicked people. He says he broke the fangs of the wicked and basically pulled the people out of the mouths that the, that, that the wicked were, were consuming. That's what he's saying here. He rescued those who were being oppressed by the wicked. Man, it would be so great to see more judges with Job's attitude when it comes to dealing with the wicked in our courtrooms today instead of the leniency that we see given to criminal, criminals, which is common in our courts today. I mean, letting criminals steal is, and not be prosecuted, you know, if it's, if it's under, you know, so much money. 
Can you believe it? This was a headline I saw yesterday, and I wasn't even looking for it, but it's so common today, we're hearing more and more about it, especially with, with the, 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 the liberal left. Here it is. California lets convicted murderers, and we were talking about children a minute ago. California lets convicted murderers of children and pregnant women out of jail amidst coronavirus panic. California Governor Gavin Newsom is exploiting the coronavirus crisis in order to make more quickly to, in order to more quickly implement far-left criminal justice policies, which has allowed at least one convicted child murderer, murderer to get back on the streets. More and more, we're seeing it. We're reading about it. Too many people are a friend of evil instead of being an enemy of evil. Verse 18. Then I said, I shall die in my nest and multiply my days as the sand. Job's situation that he was in caused him to think that, that his future would also be good. So he predicted for himself a good future. Now, when all of this began, Job didn't expect the troubles from Satan. And yet it's true that, that those who live a righteous life don't live expecting judgment from God. Those who are living a righteous life. The redeemed don't have a, fear, don't have a fearful look to the future. They don't have a fearful outlook of the future. But the unsaved often look at the future with a lot of uncertainty. Because the heart of the wicked, they don't have a peaceful heart. Isaiah 48, 22 says, There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. Only God can give true and lasting peace. If a person is living apart from God, if they're living in sin, they cannot find peace in the world today. I mean, we can go back as far as we can in recorded history, and that will tell us that, that anybody living apart from God hasn't had that peace. The heart of the wicked is not a peaceful heart. It can be hardened to the point that it doesn't fear the future. But sin has kind of a built-in warning system about the future. The redeemed, that is the saved, those who have been made righteous through Jesus Christ, especially have a blessed hope, and they have an expectation of the future. Titus 2.13 says, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Notice, great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, speaking of his deity. Great God and Savior. Verses 24 and 25. He says, if I mocked at them, they did not believe it. In the light of my countenance, they did not cast down. I chose the way for them and sat as chief, so I dwelt as a king in the army as one who comforts mourners. Job was friendly. He wasn't a grouchy old man. He wasn't proud and he wasn't stuck up. He was such a different kind of man compared to those who were wealthy and in high positions, so much so that when he smiled at people, they were so surprised they could hardly believe it. They weren't used to that. People in high positions, and, and you know, they get to a point where you know, they just ignore you. Job smiled at people, and when they did, they, 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 they were surprised. They couldn't believe it. His friends' were accusations were false, and they were cruel. And as we've said all along, this strongly suggested that they were jealous and envious of him. So when we talk about the past, Warren Wiersbe said this, the past must be more than a memory. It must be a ministry. must be a ministry today will soon be tomorrow he says are you using today to grow in the lord so that you're ready for tomorrow is life an investment 
or just an enjoyment. Howard Hendricks says, you learn from the past, but you don't live in it. So many people live in the past. You can't change the past. Learn from it. Someone said, and I can't remember what it was either, he said, some people turn the past into a museum. What do you do at a museum? You go in and you look at everything. And many times people go back to, and they just, stand, they just sit there and they look at the past. They get all bummed out. Warren Wiersbe also said, you don't heal yesterday by not enjoying today. The best way to destroy today is to regret yesterday and worry about tomorrow. Father, we thank you so much for this great chapter, Lord. And <clears throat> Father, help us to look at the past as a ministry, God. To look at it as a ministry is to learn from it and to grow by it and, and to not make the same mistakes that we did in the past, God. but to change the way we do things for the better and to grow and to mature from the things of the past, but not make it a museum and wish, oh, I could go back. Everything that's in your life as a believer, it is, you know, has been ordained by God. Though we, as hard as that might be to, to take or to understand, it's a part of God's infinite wisdom for my life. So Lord, help us to trust you in every way and everything. God, to keep our eyes upon you. To know that you're, you're, you're working in my life today as you did in the past and you're going to work in my life for tomorrow. As Jeremiah said, that we might have a hope in the future and your thoughts of us are for good and not evil. And that all things work for good for those who love you and are called according to his purpose, not mine nor my desires, but according to his will and his purpose for my life. Thank you, God, for your love and your grace. Thank you for everything, Lord, in our lives. Father, may you bless my brothers and sisters here this evening. May you bless the rest of their week. May you get them home safely, God. Lord, may you cover them, keep them healthy. May they do everything that they can to be, stay healthy, Lord. Let us not take anything for granted, Lord. And we, we lay the rest into your hands, Lord. Lord, bless again um, the children's program, Lord, and have your hand upon it, Lord. Use it for your glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. A couple of quick announcements. Again, the children's uh, Christmas program this Saturday. Uh, the three of them, it's at five, six, and seven. There are still some space if you want to sign up your kids or, or whoever, you know, what children might, you know, your, your grandkids or whatever. And uh, still room to sign them up. So you can go on uh, our website and, and check out the details and what you need to do. And also, we'll, we'll look at uh, Sunday morning, part three of uh, The Christ of Christmas. And uh, it's entitled Good News for Everyone. It'll be Luke chapter two, verses one through 14. God bless you guys. Awesome. Can you please stand with me? Oh, Lord, my God, in you I put my trust. Oh, Lord, my God, in you I put my hope. Oh, Lord, my God, 
in you I put my trust. Oh Lord, my God, in you I put my hope. In you, in you I find my peace. In you, in you I find my strength. In you I live and move and breathe. Let everything I say and do be founded by my faith in you. I lift up holy hands and sing. Let the praises ring. Oh, Lord, my God, to you I give my hands. Oh, Lord, my God, to you I give my feet. Oh, Lord, my God, to you I give my everything. Oh, Lord, my God, to you I give my life. In you, in you I find my peace. In you, in you I find my strength. In you I live and move and breathe. Let everything I say and do be founded by my faith in you. I lift up holy hands and sing. Let the praises ring. Let the praises ring. Let the praises ring. Let the praises ring. Let the